Okay, well, if you're wondering why I don't have a chicken on my shoulder this time, they're all playing outside. Oh, oh, wow. We got a whole little animal kingdom going on out there. We got little blackbirds outside the coop interacting with the chickens. There's a rabbit sitting there. Hold up, I got a video of this. Aw, oh, that was just delightful. Okay, welcome to the fourth video out of 10 in which I am critiquing and expanding on my old world building videos before re-uploading them to this new channel. I also have my main channel, primarily for sewing content, if that is a thing which intrigues you. This one was on clothing differences based on class and status for my fictional semi-aquatic race, the Nauticans. These clothing videos haven't had much that I wanted to flat out retcon until now, but let's watch the original and I'll explain from there. Go to this timestamp to skip the old video. Hello, and welcome to the third video in my series about creating a system of clothing for a fantasy race. The race I'm building is one I've created, and until I finish my naming language, I'm calling them the Nauticans. They are near human, but have the ability to breathe underwater. Because of the politics and history in my world, they've been driven into hiding below the ocean, where they've built a contained city of metal and glass. Because their environment and way of life is so different, with unique challenges and lack of trade with the mainland, I felt they would have an equally unique system of clothing. In the first video of this series, I covered the different sources and inspirations I combined with the Nauticans' available resources to come up with a standard look. In the second video, I expanded on this look and categorized things that would be considered masculine or feminine in their culture. In this video, I'm going to expand it further to determine what would be worn by wealthier citizens versus the poorer citizens, and what the different classes might wear for a formal occasion versus work. You'll notice there is a dashed line between those two categories, and that's because there will be plenty of room for crossover, though there will be a few distinct differences. The first difference between high class and low class is the quality of fabric. This is very true in real world fashion as well. In my world, the Nauticans have cultivated more underwater plants to grow produce, and one such plant contains fibers that can be spun and woven into a rough fabric I call sea silk. Anyone can harvest and spin this fiber themselves, but it can also be processed through a mill to remove imperfections, and the resulting fibers will be much finer and smoother, and will weave into much softer, thinner, and more flowing fabric. As you can imagine, the professionally woven fabric will be much more expensive than fabric you weave yourself, and therefore will be a luxury item that only wealthier individuals could afford. For now, I'm calling the finer fabric water weave, and the coarser, homespun fabric rough weave. Alright, let's get into the new stuff. To show the increasing contrast between the classes, I'm going to duplicate my man and woman. One thing wealthier individuals could do to show their status is to pleat and starch their fabric, instead of letting it drape naturally, much like how ancient Egyptians pleated their clothing. The effect would be crisp, angular, and tidy looking. This is something that would be time-consuming and would therefore be a visual sign that you either had spare time to spend maintaining your wardrobe, or that you could afford a laundry service to wash and pleat your fabrics, especially since the pleats would not hold very long in a high-humidity environment and would need regular maintenance. Countering this, one way people of the lower classes could make their clothing cheaper would be to askew the traditional ways clothing was cut, sewn, and draped, with the voluminous pants and wrapped tops, and to introduce new methods of sewing their clothes that would leave less fabric for the drapes and be more conservative with waste. These new styles might be considered less attractive, but for work clothing in particular that wears out faster, it would be much more cost-effective. Another way upper-class people might display their wealth is through jewelry. I already mentioned their affinity for metalwork in another video, and intricately wrought jewelry set with real gemstones would be highly valued, and would probably get increasingly elaborate and impractical the wealthier you were. On the other end of the spectrum, those who could not afford such overstated jewelry would be limited only to practical pieces that served specific functions, and those pieces would be simpler and set with colored glass instead of real stones. Another class divide is something that I thought up, then the more I thought about it, it almost turned into a story itself. What if, traditionally, fishermen would tie a net around their waist as they swam, keeping their hands free until they needed it? So it would be normal to see common folk walking around the city with nets tied around their waists. What if the upper class started to do this too? Almost as a political act of solidarity with the common people. However, the upper class wasn't tying actual fishing nets around their waists. Instead, they were like giant doilies folded in half, crocheted of sea silk with beads woven into elaborate designs. Such a thing would cost as much as the average fisherman earned in a month. 
so it didn't have the unifying effect the people thought it would, and instead drives a further wedge between the classes. I once read a book called Queen of Fashion, What Marie Antoinette Wore to the Revolution, and it's filled with similar stories of bizarre choices she made throughout her life. The word insensitive isn't even on the scale, and it wasn't because she didn't care exactly, she just had absolutely no concept of what regular people's lives were like. For example, she got tired of the panniers and the court dresses, and decided she wanted a light, comfy, casual dress so that she could pretend she was a farm girl. The resulting dress was this full, ruffled dress made of yards and yards of thin, hard-to-keep-clean white cotton. When the starving masses saw her dress like that, they were horrified because to them she didn't look like a country girl. To them, the dress looked like a chemise, which is the very base layer of clothing worn underneath the corset. So they named the getup Chemise a la Reine, which most accurately translates to the queen's underwear. Anyways, I'm getting off topic, but what if something similar happened here, and the extravagant nets around the waist came to symbolize the upper class disconnect, and they almost became taboo to wear? But the fashion was already established, so people instead began to wear a wrap in the same style, but made from fabric. Another category that I covered in the first video was fabric printing. The sea silk is naturally a pearl gray color, and the Nautican City only has access to three dyes that can be harvested underwater. Blue is the most common and accessible, yellow must be purchased, but it isn't too expensive, and red is very rare and must be transported from a great distance, so only the richest can afford it. Along with the colors available, the level of detail of the designs painted on the fabric is also an indication of wealth, with poorer people being limited to designs they can paint themselves instead of professional artists working on complicated patterns. So I do think the lower class would tend towards more organic, free-flowing art, while the professionally painted fabric would favor highly structured, complex, geometric designs. This next portion will be the formal wear and special occasion clothing. Some of it will be recapped, so I'll skip through it quickly. Lower class women trying to dress up would probably pull out a wrapped skirt. As I said in an earlier video, skirts are not native to their culture, but were picked up from the people on the mainland, along with the idea of skirts being a feminine and elegant thing to wear. Skirts would require a much larger piece of fabric than the narrow scarves the rest of their clothes are made of, and therefore must be purchased. So if a lower class woman did own a skirt, she would probably save it for special occasions. An upper class woman would make sure her skirt had fresh, crisp pleats and maybe a contrasting border. I also said in the last video that men wear a piece of metal jewelry called a cross piece for formal or professional occasions. Someone pointed out in the comments that I had made the diamond in the center too large, and it would be poking into the man's stomach. Good catch, I hadn't noticed that, and I did go back and shrink it down a bit. They would be decorative, usually a showpiece for a family crest, though it could display symbolism for a group, or your employer, or perhaps your school. A wealthy man's cross piece would be much more richly designed, and he might even be able to afford metalwork for the bands that hold it in place. A poor man's would be simpler, possibly a family heirloom, and would be held in place with fabric. Quality of fabric is a point I covered in the class category, but there is way more to be said. To get more formal, multiple layers could be worn. Fine shears, heavy woven jacquards, netted lace, beadwork, and embroidery could all be layered together. Because the baseline that most of the clothes are made of is a long rectangle of fabric the size of a scarf, different styles could be achieved based solely on how you wrap the scarves, and this gives a great amount of versatility to special pieces. If a woman worked for a year to embroider one piece, she could bring it out for special occasions and wrap it differently as the styles progressed and changed then she could pass it on. With such a stable, versatile base element, beautiful fabrics could be worth investing in for special occasions. So let's bring it all together and see what our lower class couple might dress like on a special occasion. They would have a real contrast, whereas the high class couple would dress about the same, just much more so of everything. Bigger, shinier, more details. And the last element of this category I want to cover is the shoes. Leather is not common below the ocean, but it's not impossible to find. However, moisture causes leather to break down faster, so it's not practical to use in a wet environment. The Nauticans have mostly eliminated its use by using metal wherever they can, and shoes are the one item that doesn't really work in metal. For shoes, it's better to just replace them, although that is pretty frequent. That's why the Nauticans all wear simple moccasins. Because their shoes wear out so quickly, most shoes are made as simply as possible. However, this doesn't mean they couldn't make more complicated, fitted shoes. If you're rich, do whatever you want. Buy fancy shoes. Buy shoes with beadwork. They'll last the same amount of time, you just spent way more on them. Unless they're a special pair of shoes, held in an airtight box and only brought out for one festival of the year. Now in the work clothes category, one factor that would affect everyone is what you wear in the water. Lower class people spend more time in the water, fish hunting, fish herding, farming the seafloor, etc. But wealthy people would spend time in the water as well. 
and traditionally everyone has worn pants in the water, but tied and laced down below the knee. The quality of the pants and the fabrics might be different for the upper class, but the basic fit of the pants would be universal. The women might tuck in the drapes of their tops like the men do, but the tied down pants are the important factor. And a worker who spends most of his time underwater might always keep them tied, out of convenience or habit. The other element of work clothing that is super important in a lot of societies is the concept of a uniform. Think about it. Chef, airline hostess, graduate, all of those words bring an image to your head, not because of the people, but because of the uniform. I think clearly defining different groups of people within your society who might wear a uniform can go an unexpectedly long way in your world building. So far I've thought of several people groups who might wear a uniform, but I've only detailed out the uniforms of the city guard. It will be based and expanded from the basic male armor I covered in the last video, with the addition of a helm based roughly on a Roman-style helmet, but with the decorative elements being fin-like and designed after fish. I did talk to someone after the last video about armor, and I think I'm going to change or add to this, potentially doing a video after I'm done with this series about how combat would be different underwater and what weapons and armor would suit it best. Alright, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. Okay, there are a lot of retcons going into this one. Almost every single element I mentioned is getting tweaked or completely changed, but that's okay. Just because I put it out there on YouTube doesn't mean I don't get to change my mind. First, we must work on the stupid color palette. I can't remember why I chose only primary colors, and I don't know why I went with these shades, seeing that when I actually made the clothes, I went with deeper, richer fabric colors. Since I can't remember why I picked them, it was probably completely at random, so take two. <laughs> First, let's talk fabrics. Sea silk made from clam byssus is still the best. It is the traditional nautican fabric of fine quality, which can be woven into a variety of textures from dense heavy weaves to lightweight shears. Historically, byssus was raised, harvested, and spun in homestead fashion. However, there has always been a scarcity issue with the clams being slow to grow and only a tiny amount of byssus able to be harvested at a time in order to protect the clams. So families would treat silk with care, rarely cutting into the fabric and passing their fine scarves down through the generations. When Nauticans originally migrated to the mainland, somewhere around 800 years ago, they adopted many of the mainlanders' cultural elements and experimented with newly accessible fibers. Their own sea silk was still the best for water wear, but it was even harder to acquire now that it must be sent inland from the sea. Somewhere along the line, Nauticans discovered how to grow lotus in the shallows and harvest it to make a new type of fabric. Maybe they learned this from the river mermaids. It is called lotus linen. It is not as versatile and can't be woven as finely as sea silk, but it functions well enough. Then, when the Nauticans began returning to the ocean, nearly a century ago, they rediscovered their love of sea silk. But they also began using a third fabric. Due to technological advancements, they could now process common sea kelp into fibers and make kelp cloth. Can you tell yet that I'm an absolute sucker for alliteration? Kelp cloth is also quite coarse, but it can be produced and sold cheaply to the working class. We're only going to talk about the current day underwater city and the dyes available from the ocean. This is not including the surface dwelling nauticans like Tsari, who wear more lotus linen and have a completely different color palette. The ocean nauticans have two fibers available, as discussed. Processed kelp cloth comes out pale gray. Natural sea silk is dark brown. In life, sea silk is bleached from brown to yellow, so nauticans could half bleach the byssus to achieve a rich golden color, or they could fully bleach it to a pale yellow, which could be used as is, but it would also be light enough at that point to over dye. One of the most common historical dyes to come from the ocean was purple, from a few different species of snails and mollusks. The purple achieved a variety of tints, from eggplant to magenta to navy blue. When dyeing things, if you don't already know, the first cloth to go in the dye will be the brightest and richest color. Every subsequent fabric after that will come out weaker and lighter, so rich, bold, bright colors were traditionally signs of greater wealth. Then I looked for other sources of dye in the ocean. I found someone who was researching ways seaweed and kelp could be used, which is where the idea for kelp cloth came from. In this study, dyes could be derived in a variety of shades of green, gold, brown, and even gray and pink. And finally, octopus ink. I couldn't find reference to octopus ink being used as fabric dye historically, but it did have many uses, including as writing ink. Which, hey, if you were wondering why they would use brushes and have a swirly, curly written language, there you go. They had octopus ink. But I don't see why it couldn't be used for fabric dye. Octopus ink is usually black, but it can also be dark navy blue or dark brown. However, I want to keep the octopus ink in a section of its own for now. I'm beginning to think that nauticans have a special cultural significance for octopi. 
both from history and mythology, but also because they're so intelligent, and also because Nautikin's first writing ink came from octopi. We'll get more into it later, right now it's just an idea I'm playing with, but it's making me wonder if wearing octopus colors would have special relevance. Like, maybe wearing black is a priestly thing? I don't know, I haven't really figured out much about priests or religion yet for Nautikins. I see mainstream Nautikin culture as being highly rooted in rigid traditionalism, but I also don't see them as being particularly religious. Like, they believe in the gods, but Nautikins definitely don't worship them. It's a weird mixture, but it will make more sense when I get into their history and origin story. So yeah, this is the color palette I'm going with. In real life, there would be countless shades and tints and blends, plus the occasional dyes traded from the mainland, but you have to simplify art, so I think this is plenty to get the idea across. Okay, let's see. Pleats. Garbage idea. <laughs> High humidity, I just don't think it would work well enough to ever become the cultural norm. Instead, a much better way to denote status would be volume, the amount of fabric used. Especially extremely fine, almost completely sheer sea silks gathered and layered atop each other. That would be the ultimate flex move. And I drew the original fancy woman in a slim, fitted skirt, but an actual high-class woman would definitely prefer voluminous, gathered skirts. Though over time, living in the underwater city with dense urban life, I think skirts would slim down considerably, especially for daily wear. Like how urbanization following the American Civil War contributed to the swift demise of hoop skirts, as women decided they wanted to be narrower when they walked down busy city streets, so they started wearing bustles instead. So yes, pleats do not denote status, but multiple layers and dense gathers do instead. Dead. Okay, work clothes. I don't like the idea of repatterning the clothes. They could, especially with the lower cost kelp cloth available to cut up instead of their precious sea silk, but that's not super historical. Historically, the wealthy and working classes did not dress in completely different fashions. There was consistency in the silhouette and the pieces used, but the working class was scaled down. A look that the wealthy would consider underclothing was perfectly fine for workwear. So instead, let's keep the elemental style the same, but simplify and lighten it. The pants would be slimmer, less voluminous, and probably tying the lower portion down to keep it out of the way would be normal. So maybe modern work pants are made slimmer with a built-in series of loops to thread the lacing cord through and to help it stay positioned better, like Zari's pants. For a person who worked submerged in water, they might lose the pants entirely and just wear their light undershorts. They would wear either very slim, light tops with all of the loose ends firmly secured, or they might lose the tops entirely depending on the work they did. In the previous video talking about Zari, I discussed what she might wear as a surface-dwelling nautican. Maybe when they lived on the surface, wearing lightweight but covering jackets became common so they could more easily work on the surface without having to worry about the sun. Wrist wraps also became common to protect the lower arms when the sleeves rode up, but those styles have begun to disappear in the city as they no longer fulfill a useful function, and clothing is evolving, returning to traditional elements but slimming them down. For jewelry, there isn't a ton I want to change. Somebody pointed out in a previous video that the hair beads would also help weigh the braids down and keep the hair from floating up and getting in the way while submerged. Love that. All of the metal in general would be good for keeping yourself stabilized while underwater, so maybe that is the historical origin of Nautican jewelry. Though I also like the idea of them just being attracted to shiny things. Somebody asked if maybe metal would be better on the shoulders instead of as shoes for keeping yourself weighed down when working underwater. I countered with ballast that could be fixed to their belts. I like that idea because the weights would be more centered on the body, and you could easily add or remove weight depending on what you need. However, it also occurred to me that the ballast might be the origin of the cross piece. Maybe they wore two, one on the chest and one on the back. Though that doesn't give a reason why it would be gendered, so I don't really know yet. Maybe it was the traditional weight used and ballast on the belts is more common now. I'll have to give that one a bit more thought. I still like the giant doily net waist wraps, but I do want to simplify the fabrics and textures I talked about. Yes to the shears, the heavyweight fabrics, and the fine lace work, but no to beadwork and embroidery. Could they have it? Absolutely. But part of this is about creating a look that will be distinct from the mainlanders, and I really love the Nautican pairing of fine slippery silks with glinting jewelry. If I was world building just for the sake of world building, there wouldn't be a problem. But since I'm world building for the sake of storytelling, sometimes you need to simplify and eliminate things to give the people consistency. And I think I want to lean harder into that silk and metal combination. Next, leather. 
I think I was exaggerating to myself the vulnerability of leather just for the sake of justifying metal use instead. I don't think that's necessary, but I do think they would prefer metal whenever they can have it, mostly for aesthetic reasons. So maybe the working class would use leather more in their belts or necklace pieces or whatever. As discussed in the previous updated videos, fish leather is totally a thing, and so are underwater mammals, duh. <laughs> so maybe common people use leather that's a byproduct of fish farming, such as sea cows. Upper class people might use fancy exotic leather, like shiny black manta ray leather or soft seal skin. As discussed, getting rid of the beaded moccasins. I want to save beadwork for other cultures. I still like the idea of uniforms, but I haven't done enough work on the culture and different time periods to really flesh this out. I will say though, since I talked about a soldier and armor, I have gotten way more comments on armor and weaponry than I can count. Most are helpful suggestions, but like, I'm not ready to go there yet. I get it though, I'm like, fashion! And I guess they should have armor too. And a ton of world builders out there seem to be the opposite. They're like, yeah, armor! Oh right, clothes are a thing. So I get it. And in the future, I'll probably have to do a dedicated video on Nautican armor and weapons and fighting styles, but I'm not ready to go there yet. I'll tell you when to begin the avalanche of suggestions. <laughs> and finally, comments. I don't think I have time to go over comments in this video because there were so many retcons to cover. And also, I really wanted to discuss some of the things I've been theorizing about based on my comment section. I've been thinking about the nature of world building. Some people learn to world build from videos such as these and such as those made by Shadowversity, Artifexian, Hello Future Me, Stoneworks, and others. Other people learned from their favorite childhood book series. And many people began to world build of their own volition as children, without anybody telling them how world building was supposed to work. I remember I started to world build about fifth grade or so. I had a friend who told me about a story she was writing. I don't remember much, but it was about a girl traveling across a desert. She finds a bracelet in the sand, and when she puts it on, a genie girl pops out. She told me that, and I thought, huh. And just like that, a world existed in my head. It started out completely blank, just one large desert. I, being an incredibly original 11-year-old, also decided that my story was about a girl wandering through the desert. But instead of finding a genie, she found an avian boy with a broken wing. Then of course she had to be coming from somewhere and going somewhere, so there must be at least one civilization on either side of the desert. Then I decided that was plenty big enough for one world, so I made it an island. One desert island with very different opposing countries on either side. I'm still trying to figure out the internal symbolism behind that idea. But the girl, instead of choosing one country over another, angled straight for the ocean, where she made some mermaid friends. Because of course she did, I was 12. <laughs> then, as I've told you before, I went canoeing in the Ozarks, and suddenly there was a mountain range dividing the desert from the sea. And the world grew and grew until that tiny island became an entire continent, which I haven't even bothered to digitize most of because it's still not big enough. So all of that to say, everybody follows their own path into world building, and the worlds we create will be vastly different according to our unique experiences and inspirations. I don't think I ever realized how different everyone's approach to world building is until I started making videos. The comments people make about my world are very insightful, the incorrect assumptions people sometimes make, and the elements they're confused by because I never bothered to explain, because the reasoning seemed obvious to me. <laughs> For example, evolution. I get an absolute frick ton of comments in every single video pointing out the evolutionary flaws in my world, which was at first just baffling. I hadn't even considered evolution because to me it was obviously magical. That was my instinctive world building angle. None of this stuff can exist anyways, so of course it was created by magic. But I'm beginning to understand that many people instinctively world build from an evolutionary standpoint, and that's okay. That is probably the best part about all of this, getting to learn about other people's minds and creativity and the progression of thought that leads to their worlds. So that is one divide I've identified, a spectrum or a scale from evolution to magical origin. And I don't think it's clear cut. Probably most people are not on either extreme end. I would rate myself more on the magic end, but not, not far. Because if the magic is old and the creation happened long ago, then things will keep evolving in the meantime. So the way things have progressed since the origin needs to be logical to me. Now, a tangential divide is fantasy versus science fiction. I think this one will have a lot of overlap with the magic slash evolution divide, but not entirely. Then there is the divide that I think maybe is the most important. Let's call it speculative world building versus wish fulfillment world building. I think this one is incredibly important to understand because of how it affects the way we view other people's work. 
both are valid. There are some elements of wish fulfillment in my world, but I primarily world build in a very speculative way. If this existed, how would it spiral and affect everything else? What problems would it cause, and how would the people deal with these issues? But if your bent is to create a story that fixes all of the problems you see in the real world around you, that's just as interesting. Wish fulfillment offers an important form of escapism both to the creator and to the consumer. Why do I think this divide is most important? Because it underlines every decision a world builder makes. Speculative world builders are okay with a level of dysfunction in their world. That doesn't mean it's how they think our world should be, but it is how they feel like a particular group would develop given a set of circumstances or a unique element of their biology or history. Wish fulfillment world builders want to use their world as a canvas to envision solutions to our society's problems. And I think there is great disconnect between these mentalities. You could say speculators create problems, wish fulfillers solve problems. Both are interesting and make good settings for stories, but because there is a tendency to assume others world build the same way you do, I think there's also a tendency to project false motives onto another world builder. And the last divide I've identified so far is world building for its own sake and world building for the sake of storytelling. I think there may be a level of overlap with the previous category. Worlds that exist only in a creator's own mind are often wish fulfillment because why not? Why would you want to create a world with suffering in it if it's only for your own amusement? You can write a good wish fulfillment story, and stories imagining a better world are beneficial in many ways. But I think people who world build for the sake of storytelling are often speculators. They're okay with creating flaws and issues for the people because that gives their characters problems to solve. It creates story. They create worlds with inequalities and corruption and flaws for their characters to struggle against. They aren't trying to create cultures that are their personal ideal utopia. They want a world that has character flaws and arcs throughout their histories. They want characters to make decisions that don't just affect themselves, but have a broader, hopefully positive, impact on the larger world around them. And that would not be as powerful if they created completely unobjectionable, inoffensive cultures. And actually, I thought of one more divide. The building of a broader world versus the individual character. This one is also very connected to the previous divides. World building establishes the norm. Storytelling is creating a character who breaks the norm and then telling the story of why. World building for storytelling is literally creating rules that are meant to be broken. In my own world building videos, I've never really clarified that when I'm establishing rules for a culture, they aren't really rules. They are recognizable patterns of behavior or highly generalized cultural norms. That does not mean that every single individual within the culture conforms to these norms I'm establishing. Just like in life, no individual perfectly fits a mold. But you need to have the mold before you can tell the story of how and why an individual in your world breaks the mold. So yes, I wanted to discuss this because in the comment section, not only do people critique my ideas, they present their own. There have been a wide array of ideas, vastly different worlds presented to me, coming from vastly different viewpoints and diverse thought. It's become clear to me how wide a range of opinions people have about exactly what world building is and what it should be. And I wanted to theorize and try to quantify exactly what and why people believe about the nature of world building. I also think having greater insight to other people's way of thinking will allow us to better enjoy different worlds when we aren't trying to conform them to our own desires in a fantasy. World building is personal, and I really hope as this channel grows and expands, it gives me the opportunity to highlight other world builders out there. And even more, I hope other people start channels. <laughs> there are already a ton of channels out there telling you how to world build, but I dearly wish to see more channels crop up displaying world building projects in action, like Eva from World Building notes and Mark Brunette's Chroma Island project. So yes, keep it up in the comments. I'm curious to see if you identify more with the world builder or the storyteller, if your world is more speculative or more wish fulfillment, if your instincts are towards fantasy and magic or sci-fi and evolution. I suspect most people will be somewhere on a scale, not leaning heavily into any extreme. Oh, and also, I started a new Instagram to link to this channel. It is at MP World Building, and I'll only be posting world building content there. A few people have tried to send me links and pictures in the comments section, and they usually get removed, like, instantly. You'd be better off trying on Instagram. Anyways, as I make this video, I'm sitting at 5,700 subs, and I'm waiting on approval to get monetized, which is fantastic. It is really, really cool to see how quickly this channel is growing, considering how long it took me to get anywhere on my first channel. So thanks, and I'll see you next time.